name is Linda Cedillos. Uh, the pictures you see right here is me and my husband. He's from Honduras. And this is my husband with my daughter, Victoria. I'm going to actually have to read and not look at you so much because I get really emotional and I want to get my point across clearly to you. Hi, my name is Linda Cedillos and I'm honored to be here today to represent all the families who are suffering and torn apart over immigration matters. I want to first thank you for the opportunity to come here and share my story with you. I would also like to thank God that we are all able to stand here today in this great country and have the right to freedom of speech because some are not so fortunate. My story is one of love, pain, happiness, sadness, suffering, and faith in God. My husband, Roberto Cedillos, came to this country in 2005 from Honduras with the dream of making a better life for his family. He had the misunderstanding that he could come across the Mexican-American border and turn himself in to immigration officials and apply for TPS. For those who don't know what TPS is, it's Temporary Protective Status. It was given to Hondurans, and I believe Ecuadorians. Um, see, and um, you have to understand that back in 2005, Hondurans were allowed to apply for this due to the living condu conditions in their country due to Hurricane Mitch. This is exactly what he did. He came to the U.S., went to the airport, and asked to speak with someone who worked with immigration. Department of Homeland Security officials came and took him to their local office in Harlingen, Texas, and began processing. Also, you should know that TPS had been extended until July, to, July 5, 2006, but the deadline to apply was July 3, 2005, and my husband had arrived less than two months later on September 3, 2006. He was told that he would be allowed to remain in the U.S., but he would have to return and go to court the following year. Roberto had to travel to New York because at that time he spoke no English, did not understand the laws of the U.S., and knew absolutely nothing of this country. While living in New York and moving numerous times to try to survive, he lost the one and only document that he had with court information and any contact numbers to inform anyone that he had no way to return to Texas. And unfortunately, he assumed that since he was not automatically deported, he was allowed to remain in the U.S. and not broken any laws. In 2007, Roberto, Roberto moved to Virginia. We met, and on August 5th, 2008, we married. This will be my second anniversary without him this year, our, first, our fifth wedding anniversary. We began filing papers the following year. We had filed the I-130, which is to prove that you are married for love and not for papers. It was approved. Imagine our happiness to think we are on our way to have what we dreamed of. I had a contact with ICE in Hampton, Virginia that I had been talking to with the name of Brett Cole. When I spoke with him, he told me I need not do the visa, but to do the I-485, which is Adjustment of Status Forms for USCIS, which stands for United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, because Roberto was in the country, and that's what we needed to do. I specifically asked him, if I do this, won't you come and take him? He replied, no, Linda, because you are trying to do the right thing, and if we wanted to take him, we had have already came for him because we know where you live. So I did as he said. I paid $1,075, filed the I-45 in 2011. I received a reply back from USCIS stating that they had denied the I-485 due to Roberto had a prior deportation order in absentia. That means that the judge ordered him removed from the country for not appearing in court in 2006. We had no idea what all this meant, so I filed what's called a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act to find out what happened. This is when I found out that he had a final deportation order. No show cause, no way to explain why he did not appear in court, no second chance, no nothing. Only he would not be able to remain in the U.S. with his family. On January 26, 2012, last year, I took my 12-year-old daughter at the time, Victoria, to school, came home, pulled up in the parking lot of our apartment at 7.30 in the morning. I was surrounded by ICE agents. I did not know what to do. Should I drive off? Should I call someone? What should I do? I rolled down the window and they asked me if I knew what they were there for. I said, well, it can't be good. They asked me if Roberto was home. I said, yes. They asked me if they could come in. I said, of course. Two agents went behind me, were talking about should they go in the back of the house in case he jumped out the window. I, told, I actually laughed at them, and I told them, there is no need for that. My husband is a Christian man, and if you're going to take him out of my house, you're going to do it through the front door. 
When we went inside, Roberta was upstairs sleeping. Two agents followed me up the stairs and they watched him get dressed. Then they came downstairs. Roberto asked if he could at least brush his teeth. They told him no, he was not allowed to do that. I asked, could I at least give him some gum? They did allow me to do that out of their kindness. My husband hugged me as I cried and told me, Mommy, have faith in God. It'll be okay. The ICE agent named Mark told me this might turn out to be a good thing. I do not know how he could determine ripping my family apart could be a good thing, as he suggested to me. My husband spent two and a half months in Farmville Detention Center. In April 2012, they transferred my husband from Farmville to Fairfax, Virginia, to Pennsylvania, then to Louisiana, where he was made to sleep on the floor the first night and had no idea where I had no idea where he was until the following day when I was able to locate him. He was kept there for four days, then flown to Honduras on a Friday. My daughter, Victoria, has always made good grades, gotten the Presidential Fitness Award, was nominated for National Junior Honor Society, began to have health issues, was always showing, she began showing signs of depression. Her grades went down. She was so angry, so confused. I was diagnosed with depression. We had to sell everything. I had to move out of our home and move in with my parents. I have became a burden on my parents financially. I have put my elderly parents in debt because I had a major surgery last year in July and could not work. My husband was so worried for our daughter and he did not want me to go through surgery alone because he knew how scared I was for this surgery that I had previously been putting off for two years, but doctors said I could no longer put it off. So June 1st, my husband left Honduras last year to try to attempt to return to his family. He walked for five weeks. He rode on top of a train, taking turns with another man sleeping so they could watch over the other not to fall off the train. He walked through a desert and he made it all the way to San Antonio, Texas, but was caught and Border Patrol agents put him in Port Isabel Detention Center and my lawyer, Dean Wanderer, spent three weeks fighting to keep him here to be with me through my surgery. My surgery was scheduled for July 24th of last year. My husband was deported back to Honduras on July 20th, four days prior to my surgery. I have not seen my husband in over 18 months. I have not been able to go to see him because financially I cannot afford to go, and I'm scared to travel there because Honduras has the highest murder rate in the world, and the U.S. Embassy has warnings for Americans not to travel to Honduras due to the murder and kidnapping rates of Americans. My family has lost everything. Our home, all our belongings have had to be sold. I still owe my lawyer almost $10,000. Our lives have been turned upside down. My, I have health issues, anxiety, depression, and other various issues. My husband is living in a house that is made out of wooden pallets, and you can see through the walls and a tin roof, and one huge room shared by him, his mother, his grandfather, and his brother. He works as an industrial mechanic for a Canadian factory that makes clothing. He makes approximately $2.30 an hour, $96 a week. He can barely support himself, much less help me with the bills we have here. There is no way that I can move to Honduras due to the lack of medical care that I would receive and my daughter Victoria would not get the education she would need like she has here. Also, it would be not be a safe environment for me to take my child and I would have to take her away from her entire family and the life she has grown to have in the U.S. We are a good Christian family that has had our whole world turn upside down. And we need these laws passed to reunite our family. We attended church, played soccer, went fishing, worked. We didn't bother anyone. We went out and helped feed the homeless. We were part of our community. We've spent the last six years paying fines, filing thousands of dollars, paying thousands of dollars, filing papers, trying to do the right thing. My husband never drove. He learned to read, write, and speak English. He was studying the citizenship tests. He had big dreams that one day he would be accepted into this country as a citizen and this world would remain his home. We are a family of great faith and belief in God, and everything has a reason and a purpose behind it pertaining to God and his plan for our life. We truly believe that, yes, we have laws and we must abide by them, but every law must be reviewed, and if this man-made laws are not in accordance with the laws of God, then they need to be changed. Immigration laws are made in accordance with man-made laws. They are not made in accordance with the laws of God. Mark 10, 9 states, Therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. Also in Matthew 19, 6, Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. 
Some people want to argue and say, what about the laws to obey the government? Romans 13, 1, 5. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, who resists his authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Please know that God ordained government to punish wicked doers and to praise the righteous. The question I have, what do we do with the government who rejects its God-ordained duty and does the exact opposite? Praising and protecting the wicked while punishing and persecuting the righteous? This passage does not deal with that dilemma. I believe the Apostle Peter answered the question when he said, We must obey God rather than men. Acts 5.29 Again and again we see in Scripture that when God's law and man's law conflicts, the saints of God must obey God. In 1 Peter 4.8 it states, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Matthew 6, 14, 15 states, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other sins of their sins, your Father will not forgive you of your sins. Do you not agree with me that our heavenly Father is so wonderful and intelligent? He created the world and all that was in it in six days. If God wanted his children to be divided, do you think that he would not have created borders? So today I'll leave you with my prayer for you that your eyes and your hearts will be open to change and maybe, just maybe, you will see that God is the reason we are here and we must stand for what is right in the eyes of God and that is to live in harmony and peace, to just love one another, not to judge, not to hurt each other. And when a tragedy happens in this country, I have noticed people, t- people come together in love and help one another. Not notice... Not once have I noticed or heard someone say when we have tragedies in our country, do you have papers? Are you legal? Because if you are not, I will not help you. Why can't we do this on a daily basis? Why does it take a tragedy to happen for people to step in and show compassion? May God bless you all, and may the love of Christ shine through all of you. My name is Linda Cedillos. My husband is Roberto Cedillos. He's in Chiloma, Cortez, Honduras. Not seen him in 18 months, and I will fight for him until the day I die. And now I will introduce Sandra Cook, the chairperson for Virginia Organizing, and she will close this out.